Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. I'm here in the galleries of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art on the U of O campus. My guests today are Rick Bartow and Jill Hartz. Bartow is a prolific artist who lives and works in Newport, Oregon. A member of the Wyote tribe from northwestern California, Bartow invokes a striking range of cultural experiences and traditions in his drawings, paintings, sculptures, and prints. Hartz, the executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, co-curated a retrospective exhibition of Bartow's work with Makash associate curator Daniel Knapp. The exhibition, covering more than 40 years of Bartow's career, Things You Know But Cannot Explain, is on view at the museum until August 9th, 2015. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. Our Thank pleasure. you. So, Jill, let me start with you. Um, what inspired you to do a retrospective of Rick's work? Well, we have works of Rick's in our collection, and Danielle and I have always loved his work. And I think we've gotten to know more and more of his work over time. I've been here six and a half years and gotten to know Charles Froelich, who represents Rick, you know, in the gallery in Portland. And just felt the timing was right. You know, as you know, as Rick knows, um, you know, after the stroke in 2013, it was like, if there's ever a time to really look at what this amazing artist has done, now's the time to do it. And also, I think when I came out and looked at the recent work, I just fell in love with it, fell in love with the energy and everything that was coming together with that. And just, it, it's really just a great honor. I can't believe we were allowed to do this, but we it's, just, you know, it's the best part of our jobs. It's an amazing, <laughs> amazing show. Rick, um, I know that for you, um, art making is just necessity. Mm. You're a worker. You're, you're working, you're working, you're working. You've dealt with a variety of challenges, uh, Vietnam, PTSD, addiction, loss, illness, and you just keep going. Tell us about the importance of your work for enduring those kinds of challenges. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's very precious. It's just a, a matter of making marks, as I said earlier down the line. That, it's in, in our way of thinking, we all have a gift. And my gift happened to be art, drawing. You doing your job, you doing your job. You know, you, you have a gift of making the cameras working well. So it's my job. And I don't think about it too much. Uh, after the stroke and and after macro uh, degeneration of the, my right eye being taken care of now, I realize that it, it makes it uh, makes me run a little faster. Yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. always run fast. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, that's kind of what I like to do, so yeah. Tell me a little bit about your technique. I've seen some videos of you that you work standing up. Yeah. Large, often very large piece of paper, large canvases. Yeah. Seems like it's a very uh, physically demanding practice. It, it's it's physical. Bit. I call it, it's, it's, it's physical work. Um, up to six to seven foot, six, six foot high by seven foot long. Uh, and most of the work 22 by 30 on the smaller mono prints. Uh, the drawings are pretty much standard 26 by 40 uh, by uh, uh, print paper because it's, I don't really dig into it. At one point, uh, I started using a, an industrial sander to erasing parts when I couldn't get it to use it with an eraser. So I'd use a sand sander on it. As far as techniques as anything I can get my hands on. But as oh, as became more involved professionally, then I find that in fact we are a a job and we're at work and we're in a marketplace and I want to make work that's going to last as long as possible. Because I, I, I feel like if somebody spends six, seven thousand dollars or twenty-some thousand dollars for a piece, 
they're going to feel a little stubbed if it falls apart, you know, in a couple of years. So uh, I try to use the best things that I can get as far as the colors, materials. Um, I try to make it the best I can to make it last as long. I know there's a lot of, uh, of people who work off of the other way to have things that degenerate, to fall apart. I have enough trouble trying to keep my body going to don't want to start making art that falls apart the way I do, so <laughs> it's all going to work out. So you say you, were, you, know, you do a lot of erasing. Sometimes you can't get the eraser, you use the sander. Yeah. I've seen images of you. You, you don't just uh, make art with paintbrushes or with graphite sticks. I've seen you literally rubbing the paper or painting with your fingers. Yeah, whatever I have to get at it to get it in there, get it to, to make that mark. And uh, it feels so good when it's working so right. And it feels so terrible when you know that you're not got it yet. That didn't make very good sense, did it? It made perfect sense. Well, then you have to either keep at it. <laughs> yeah, or yeah you, you just have to keep yeah. going yeah. to dig out whatever it is to make it make sense in my way, which it's a, it's a little like uh, the man building the, you know, Noah and the, and the ark, you know, building a, a boat in the desert. Now, you know, as myself, making my life, taking care of families and families and children, and we're up to, you know, drawing paper. Uh, first time I took on natural, or uh, first to the, to the work was, my uh, wife was pregnant. Oh man, how was I supposed to do that? I can remember for the big arguments and arguments and arguments about what are we going to do, live for fresh air, or how are we going to live on for <laughs> raising a child and being an artist. And the spirit has been moved right, and I have to trust that and put one foot in front of the other and run a, and keep going. There have been many times, not many times, but there are times when I used to sit at my chair and look at the classified act and think, what could I get a job quick like? And something would happen, and away we'd go. And uh, so we don't look at the classified anymore. We just keep going, you know, and we live on prayer. And in, in, if not pray, pray, prayer, then it's like uh, getting my mind together, settled it in different, you know, a different way to go for positive, not negative. Jill, Jill told me that she feels that the work after the stroke is especially positive, especially filled with life. Do you feel that's the case? Oh boy, I got the sweetheart who drive me on time here. <laughs> she loves to work and, and likes just sitting and watching what's going on. But when when struggle, uh, wind dry, I can't talk very good this morning for some reason, but. The brain and the organ is an incredibly awesome orgasm, or orgasm, organism. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. It's an orgasm, too. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> at least I'm making sense. Most of the time, paraphasia kicks in, and I don't make any sense at all. So a lot of times, my, uh, my friend Marianne figures the sentence for me because I can't get to the end of it. So um, I felt very, very, very humbled and very excited because that first morning got a pinched a pen from a nurse and started noodle, noodling, doodling on the paper on a napkin or something. And I tell Charles, we're going to make it OK because I can still draw. So again, left before right, before right, before left. Keep walking and keep walking. And 
my God, you know, I can't, at some point I couldn't talk, but I could see and I could draw. And the therapist, I was a good therapist that I ran into the next day, began working on my talking. But hence my orgasm. Uh, it sometimes comes out of my mouth in the worst times, and then I don't know what's going to come out or how. It, but anyway, uh, it it really energy me. Ener energy, energy. Energizes. Energize me. Good. Thank you. It's almost like the title of the show, too. Things you know but cannot explain. Absolutely. Schopenhauer. We found out it was Schopenhauer. Oh, really? I was going to ask you, Jill, that I was couldn't my remember. I couldn't remember. It had been so many years ago. Yeah, that, that work is from 79. It's the earliest yeah. right. piece yeah. in the right. show. Jill, tell us why you chose, you and Danielle chose that as the title for the show. Well, I think it's in many respects at the core of all of what Rick does. And that's why he's an artist. That's why he's not writing books or doing something else. It's because he explains everything in a way visually um, and you can't explain in words what he does but I think it goes beyond that to an intuitive process that because you're, he, his life is work he's in the studio every day he can he's making marks all the time that you have the experience of what's going to happen because you know how to do this but there's also just this intuitive working that creates the works we see here. Um, and I think that's where you can't explain it because it's something that just comes as who you are, what your being is. And then I think you can also look at it in other levels. You can look at it as, you know, in tune with truth with a capital T, mm -hmm. or you can go in that direction, which um, Rick would call woo woo, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think woo woo is there. <laughs> So these two pieces that we're standing in front of, the sculpture from Nothing, Coyote C Creates Himself, and this is from 2004, and the painting, Performance Self-Portrait from 1991. So Rick, you are a draftsman, you're a painter, you're a sculptor. In many of your works, there are animals. Uh, coyotes, crows, bears, dogs. Um, what's the significance of all those animals, and in particular those animals? I know bears and crows recur again and again and again. What compels you to include them? Why are they so important in the work? Well, they really exist right where the old studio, my brother has the house now uh, that I bought from my uncle years ago, but we're on the coast of Yakuna Bay there. There's elk, deer, coyote, coons, all, all those smaller animals, plus the bigger ones. Uh, the beer of bears back up in there, uh, 1952 or three, something like that, the world's largest uh, mountain lion was shot about three miles back from where the house is at. Plus all of the birds, uh, many, 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 many eagles, Osprey fighting all the time around for the air area there. The hawks, all the smaller birds, the migrations. The wool, you know, the uh, uh, aquatic birds, they're all right there. So I could paint cups or tea or Mirandi do, you know, mm -hmm. real thing. but it's a lot more interesting to do that. And then clear back to Flemish the painters were mixing up animals and people together, uh, which is a lot more interesting than some other things that I could do. You've got a lot of works that mix animals yeah. and people. Yeah. Um, say a little bit more about that. Uh, the well, uh, we, you know, we talk about stories, a lot about my work as stories, mm -hmm. from Bible to myth. Uh, to guy down the street. Uh, a good story is a good story. And a myth is a good story, and they endure, endure, because there are ways to learn from those things. Um, my late wife used to say, don't preach. So we just talk about the stories. 
Um, also, though, we refer to being cross as a bear, got a frog in your throat, you know, that would make a kind of an interesting drawing, mm -hmm. you know, if nothing else. And quite simply, you know, really, that it could be that simple. Yeah. But most of the time, I just go out and start making a mess and then try to move it around to where it starts making sense, or at least pictorial. Pictorial speaking, it, it makes sense. Uh. So why don't we um, take a break and okay. move to the center of the gallery to see okay. some of the most recent work, if that's okay. 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 Yeah. Did you, you didn't want to talk about. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay, because, I mean, it. you mentioned both of yeah. these, but so, we could just say something briefly. Yeah. Um, say something briefly. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, okay? Which is that. Um, we see masks here, mm -hmm. right? We see what we think is a ceremony or something mm -hmm. like that, but that would be an easy reading of a piece that's not necessarily all or what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, the Wiats didn't use masks. No, no, so it, was a, it was a made up, it was a ceremony that never was. It was, uh, it was to fulfill uh, Trying to get money for a for a uh, for money to get money for a dance not a dance but a dance was dance was part of that. Mm -hmm. We were uh, trying to uh, get a, a fund would give us money mm -hmm. if we would do certain things, and one of them was to do a dance. And the other artists who were together. Wouldn't, wouldn't budge to be doing a dance. So I tried it and it took me weeks to get rid of it. I couldn't sleep, I was all sick of it. Then I went to Japan uh, with a bunch of pictures of crows, which they didn't like because they're har harbingers of death. Huh. But uh, somebody in Japan bought the mask of the <laughs> of the skeleton, of the skull. But the whole thing was moving and making noise and we made a, a jump out of them. So it's... Uh, yeah. So I think yeah. masks are really important in mm -hmm. Rick's work and comes in different ways. And sometimes you can think of the animal-human hybridities as kind of creating a mask, but it's also transformation. It's this fluidity that we have both in living in the natural world in a way. Um, but I just think it's interesting to note that this is not documentary. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something else that we're looking yeah, at. And, never was you know, and we should understand that part of it is just the process of making the work and also issues that Rick's working with that come out this way. His first show was all masks. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Rick's house, you'll see a wall of masks. Yeah. Collected. Not yeah. mine. Yeah, but others. But I mean, so yeah. it's very interesting in terms of what is the power and identity that a mask has, and can it change who you are, or can you learn from it? Can you become something you're not, at least temporarily? Yeah. Huh, fascinating. So let's take a quick break and walk to the center of the gallery and look at the most recent work. Okay. So we're now standing in the center of the gallery, around um, next to this grouping of recent sculptures and one of the most recent paintings behind us. And Rick, I wanted you to say a little bit about your technique in, in creating these sculptures. You were talking about you, you work with the chainsaw. Say a little bit more about how you make these and what's the process like. And I was introduced, in, introduced to grinders and chainsaws, mostly grinders by uh, an elder Maori artist John Bevan Ford, and he wanted me to make a certain cut the first morning I landed there, second day in New Zealand. Showed me how to make this mark, and I was working on it, and oh gee, it was just not working out these V uh, gouge that I'd never used, I was working on it, and I was really making a hash out of it. I was getting really frustrated. He stopped, what's wrong, with me? and you know, what's, what's going on, man? And I said, oh, I'm just messing this up. I said, I really can't get the hang of this. He said, oh, no, probably just kind of push me back a bit. He reached around the box, come out with a great big grinder. 
from <laughs> went right down the side of this pole. <laughs> <laughs> then I was working on. He said, "Now you can try it again." <laughs> and so, and he raised that that problem and started all over again. So these are. Uh, this was actually something else there. And this was nothing. And then it became something else. And then this was a leg, I think, of something actually. And it was a it was a cedar tree that was planted by my aunt when she was a child. She's now deceased. And uh, the neighbor cut it down because it was getting in trouble with this next next door to me he was having trouble with his garage roof hmm. so i got the uh got the pieces from that and made them into sculptures um parts of things are part of another pole that was left over from another job that i had doing a a pole sculpture i call them pole sculptures not totem poles because I have no lineage rights to, nor do we have any tradition to Wiat people. And so I make sculptures that look that way because they're really tall when you get done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's easier than building one. So the rest of these, this was uh, uh, construction, leftover uh, construction materials. And again, this was a leg of another animal that became into the bird of the crow flying away there. The little birds, we call them the humblers, because you see the eagle in the mythos and in our many native, materia, native material feelings about the eagle being the one closest to the creator. And they're always flying so beautiful, but the little birds come in and mess with them, so they got to jump around, you know. So we call the little ones the humblers. So even though we're as majestic and we're really the top of the thing, you still get tripped up by the littler one guns. So we figure if we're downtown and the world starts stopping, those little birds are going to be the ones making it, and the big guys are going to be having a hard time making it go. So we think of the little guys the humblers. I always like masks because I think of masks are enigmas that people cannot quite understand entirely. The mask, just put it on and it said you will hear the truth if you put on a mask. Mm. He will tell the truth. Or if you leave it off, he will lie to you. <laughs> so. mm. <laughs> And some of them have more than one face, too. Yeah. So, well, and of course, that's, that's all something that I sort of borrowed from the North, uh, North Coast guys because uh, they had uh, um, faces within faces within faces, spirits would come, you know, and so there would be many openings. So this one sort of worked that way where it came up the top and opened a little character inside of there. The other one I always thought was kind of scary down there on the on the far right. The, the sculpture. Yeah, the yeah. face looks a little demonic with a little bird right. kind of straightening him up. So. Well, I think that's part of it is that first you think they're kind of whimsical. So maybe you think they're cute. Mm. But then you look at them, you come up close, and you, some of them have teeth, and mm -hmm. they have these weird grins, and they have claws, and you realize that they're... They're not every, you know, the first impressions are not really what you're left with. They have a power that is pretty deep and can be really scary, too. Yeah, the <laughs> mixture of uh, playful and sinister, it happens mm -hmm. all over the work. Yeah, yeah. You, there for a while there was a, a, a quote for Lot and the Art, it was uh, the artist's intent and what people see it. Mm -hmm. And I always, I think it's even better if you can leave people alone because they use their own mind to 
to see what's going on, not necessarily being hand spoon spoon, you know, here's spoon your fed. here's your idea, you know, mm -hmm. because it's it's smaller it's not easy because it makes people a little nervous. Yeah. You know, and it challenges people. But my uh my son's uh, hip hop lyricist some of his get right in people's face, yeah. you know, and that <laughs> makes me nervous, you know. But there again is the new people's way of doing things, which are different than the old poops like me, you know, sit on a chair and play blah, 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 blah. Well, we'll see that tomorrow. Yeah. yeah so tomorrow. let's just, you, you're, you're, you're an artist, a visual artist, but you're also a musician, and you play with a group what's called... What's left of it? Yeah, what's left of it? I, for 50, 60 years, something like that, I've played... But uh, the stroke in uh, just a second wiped out 50 years of lyrics. I couldn't remember You Are My Sunshine. If I were to try to sing that to you, I probably couldn't do it. It just took everything out. In the spirit, it took everything. It's just an empty box. And so now my band uh, kept in pecking at me to keep going. But it was horrible. It sounded terrible because I sounded like the Muppets. <laughs> because it got close to my mouth. That's so Swedish, everything uh, I touched was like that. And so I said, I can't, I can't go through life sounding like the chefs of uh, the Muppets. I can't, can't go that way. But a couple hours we worked at it and we got, got the, the muscles kind of loose up to where they started sounding like myself again. But everything I do, I have to see on the paper. I can play, it was a funny thing about that brain monster would let me play guitar, but it wouldn't let me remember any lyrics. So it's always a little something to do, to do, you know, so. Always a little something to do. We have about a minute left. Jill, I'm gonna give you the last word. What's the last thing you want our viewers to know about this show and why they should come see it? It's a must see. It's a must see. It's like the best show in Oregon, if not in the country at this moment. Everyone has to come and see this show. I mean, it'll change. You know, art to me is about transformation. Um, for you, it's about work. For me, being able to introduce it to other people, it's about how do, how do I change the way they see the world in some way or another or think about things differently. And I think every work in this show has that power to do that. Hmm. That is a perfect way to end. Rick, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Uh, I've been speaking with artist Rick Bartow along with Jill Hartz, the executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art a retrospective exhibit of Bartow's work, Things You Know But Cannot Explain, is on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum until August 9th, 2015. Thanks so much for watching.